I'm Pastor Craig Ellison, the pastor here at Celebration Assembly. I am so glad you're here uh, in the house this morning. It's so great to, to be in your homes uh, as well uh, on the YouTubes. And uh, God is here, and it's uh, let's get ready to see what God has in store for us. So I'm going to start a new uh, series today. We kind of now finished the Waymaker series, and I know many of you were blessed and you were touched by that, and, and God is good. And I continue to pray that God makes a way in your lives where there seems to be no way. And today I want to start a, uh, I've had this kind of on my back burner, I would say for years, I don't even remember when I, but what happens, let me just tell you what happens is, when I'm reading something, uh, when I'm reading something, or when I'm hearing enough, you know, when I'm, you know, maybe hearing, you know, something on the radio, or, you know, in a Bible study, or something like that, you know, something will trigger, like, oh, that would make a great sermon series, or, oh, wow, that really hits me, I really would love to preach on that sometime. And so then I have on my, you know, I have a full, I have a file, you know, in, on my computer, I have a file called Sermon Ideas, and just a huge list of a sermon series that I could do, or just one-off sermon messages. And, um, and so sometimes I just love to pick, sometimes God just gives me a message, or sometimes I just feel like I want to pick out of those or whatever. And I had this on the list for a long time, and I just feel like, you know what, now is the time. Now, when you see the title, the title is called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, that is basically the first, the first sentence of Revelation, uh, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, what we're going to be talking about is not like end time prophecy. I'm not going to be talking about that. I know that's the big thing right now with everything going on with COVID. I know it was with the election and all that, but I'm not going there. Matter of fact, Revelation, the book of Revelation, really only talks a little bit about all that end time stuff, but it also talks quite a bit about, about not end time stuff, about how Satan was cast down and about things that have already happened. So Revelation has already has talked about things that have already happened, besides all things that are yet to come. And one of the big things that, uh, that Jesus talked about uh, in Revelation was about the seven churches, uh, the seven churches of Revelation, about what did they do right, what did they do wrong, what could they work on, and all those things. And I thought, you know what, uh, for the next few weeks, let's take church by church by church, and see some of the things they did right, they did wrong, and see how we can incorporate that in our own personal lives and our own personal church. When it comes to Revelation, Revelation is a hard book, I'll admit it. It's one of the hardest books even for me to read. So, you know what, are we all going to have the answers? No. But we're going to begin a journey together. Give me a little latitude here, we'll all have some latitude here, and um, I feel that if we can give our all to this, God is going to bless it and do some amazing things with it. So I'm excited about the ride that God has with us on this. Amen? So, let's start with this. Let's look at the book of Revelation. So if you want to turn to Revelation 1.1, we're going to start from the beginning. No, I don't mean Genesis, Revelation. So Revelation 1. If you want to turn there into your Bibles or into your uh, electronic units, whatever you want to see, it's going to be on the screen. However you get the Word of God, let's read it. And as we're getting there, if we have the, as to honor God, let us stand. Let us stand as we honor God's Word. We haven't done this in a while. Let's hold our Bibles or your phones up or whatever. Our Bibles are full of what? Good stuff. Our Bibles are full of incredible, awesome, wonderful stuff. Amen. One other thing that you might not have noticed is we finally, it only took me nine years. Only took me nine years. But now, um, now in the age of electronics, we finally got to it. But um, I, as you know this, I mostly read, I almost always preach out of the NIV. Why do I pick on NIV? I don't know. It's just something when I came to know the Lord. It was something that I just started with. And um, the one thing that always made it a little interesting is I would always preach out of NIV, but, what, but there was a different translation in the, in the uh, pews. Well, finally, now all the Bibles in the pews are exactly as I read them too. So if you, so if you pick up that, you're going to follow along exactly where we are. Um, I had to help uh, with, uh, with Barb and Marsha as well, and last Thursday we replaced all the, the Bibles now with NIVs, so we're all on the same page. Again, it only took nine years, but you know what, we got there, amen. All right, so Revelation 1, we're going to kind of get around here, as you can see, we're going to kind of skip around here, and so we'll see what we get. So Revelation 1, we'll start with 1 and 3. The revelation uh, from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants 
what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. So this was an angel to send to speak to John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and take it to heart what is written on it. I don't know about you, but I would love to be blessed today. I really would. And the Bible makes it very clear. Blessed are those who will read this. So I'm really excited about that. All right, now let's skip down to verse 9. The vision, uh, John's vision. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom, uh, the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that our sin, that, that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Amen. All right, now let's go to two. Now, now, now in chapter two, now we're going to look specifically at, I just wanted to, the, the first few verses were kind of giving the background of Revelation, and now we're going to look specifically now at the churches that God wanted to talk to. So first of all, let's start at chapter two, and let's look at the church of Ephesus. That's the church we're going to look at today. To the angel of the church in Ephesus writes this. This is what the angel writes to the church of Ephesus. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in the right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, and I know your hard work, and I know your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them to be false. And those are good things. Not everyone who says they're this or that are true. You need to test those. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet, see, even Jesus knew how to do that sandwich approach. Yet, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how, consider how far you have fallen. Repent. And do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor, that you hate the practice, the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I believe every church is going to have something we need to hear. And Lord God, you're going to say a lot of great things about Celebration Assembly, but you also have things that you are going to, it's, it's going to hurt, and maybe some things that are going to hit our toes a little bit. But Lord God, in the good stuff and in the bad stuff, help us to grow. Lord, open your word to us, and may we be open to every church to learn something that we as families and individuals in a church need to learn for us to grow as well. For time here on earth is short, but eternity is long. In your most holy name, amen. amen. If you didn't say, if you didn't understand what I meant before, is that, oh, if, apparently Jesus even used the, knew the sandwich approach because it was like, here are the great things you're doing, this is where you need help, and then I'll end it with something good. That's how you confront someone. All oh, the great things you're doing, okay, this is where we need to approve on, but keep up the good work. You know, that's kind of that's how that goes. So it is good to know that the Lord walked with his churches. I love that. It wasn't just that, okay, here are the churches, you do your own thing, and now it's up to you. No. I love it knowing that God cares and God walks with every one of his churches. And I, and I think that really should be a comfort to all of us. That God hasn't left Celebration Assembly. He's with us. He's with us every day. He's with us in the encouraging things, but he also wants to help us along areas that need improvement. 
The last verse of, celebra of, celebration, of chapter 1 tells us the lampstands represent the churches. And he is present with every one of our churches today. No matter how imperfect we are, he is here. He has a word for every church, each according to their needs. And again, I, I want to use this to look at what these churches have done and what they need, but I also want us to, to look at ourselves. Every church could, could be improved. Uh, we're not perfect, only Jesus is perfect. And so where are those areas that we're doing well on? And where are those areas that we need improvement on? The first, comment, uh, the first comment was to the Church of Ephesus. The theme of this message is this. Our love for Christ, our worship for Christ, must always come before our work for Christ. And that's your space right there. I'm not going to do this every single time. But only because I said it. Did anyone know what that was before I said it? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good! I think I'm going to end right there. I'm one for zero. I might have a little fun up today. But anyway, um, and why is that so? Because we can work without a love for Christ. We can work without a love for Christ just like the Pharisees. That's a very dangerous place to be in. You can be working for your own pride, to feed your own ego. But when you have a love for him, you naturally want to serve. And that's the thing. It's, that, it's not that your works will get you to heaven. No, they won't. But when you know the Lord, then you're going to want to serve him. But sometimes, sometimes the fear of this church was that they were doing the opposite, that they were doing a lot of serving, but they forgot their first love. But, but what God is saying here, if you love me first, if you never forget my love that I have for you first, just naturally, you're going to want to serve me. You can be working, but never knowing the Lord. The, the Ephesians were doing something that many of us would, be con uh, that would not consider even a problem. They're, they're working hard. They were working hard for God. Their hard work, their perseverance, and they're, and they're not tolerating wicked people. Come on, that's great stuff. But that became a problem for the church. You see, they're being too absorbed in service for God can also become a problem in our relationship with God. Matter of fact, it's even for me as a pastor, I can do a lot. Matter of fact, that's what I do all day. I, uh, I do a lot of work for God, but the dangerous thing is we can all do a lot of work for God, but not know the one we're working for. You know, just like at work, like at your work, you can do a lot of work for your boss, or you can do a lot of work for your owner, and you might never even meet your boss. And you might not ever meet your worker, but yet you're doing a great job, you're getting a raise, you're getting a promotion, but I've never met my owner. I've never met the owner of my company. Saying this can be true even in the Christian world, that we can do a lot for God, we can do a lot of great things, we can do a lot of good things, we can do the right things and, and do this and do that and get volunteer, 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 do this, do that, do that. But then you have really no relationship with the owner. You have no relationship with your boss. You have no relationship with the one, the only one that you really need to have a relationship with. It's not one or the other, it is both and, but you have to have a, your relationship with God and out of that relationship comes where you want to serve Him. Serving should not be a chore, but it should be a delight for unto the Lord. So when serving God becomes all that defines a relationship with Him, that can be an issue. When just working for Him um, just defines a relationship, no. Performance becomes the, then the only yardstick that we have. We measure our spirituality by how hard we work, by how hard we serve, how much that we put in. Matter of fact, at that point, that is when, I, and I've seen that before. I, I, I've seen that in all the churches, at every church, not just this one, every church I've served with. When I've had to confront, when I've had to confront something or someone about some, well, pastor, you don't know how long I was in this church. You don't know why I was part of Sunday school and this and this and that. I was here longer than you were born. Okay? Does it really I, you didn't say anything about your relationship with God. It's all about works. It's all about what I did. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look what I did. Do you know what I did? Do you know all I did? And God's like, man, you don't know. You, you don't have a clue. It's not about. 
of your church. You can be a part of this church for nine years and go to hell. Oh, yes, I said it. Did you hear what I said? You can be a founding member of this church and still go to hell. Yes. Hallelujah. Because it has nothing to do about just work, 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 and being here, being here, me, me, me. It has everything to do about the relationship that you have with the Almighty King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Don't tell me it's me, me, me. Tell me it's God, God, God in the relationship that I have because it's not about me. You were bought with a price. Your body is not your own. You are sacrificed to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That is what it's all about. Our relationship with God. Not works-based, but relationship-based. And out of that, I serve. Out of that, I find delight. Out of that, I serve my God. God is in this room, and God is in this place, and God wants to speak to us. We measure our spirituality by how hard we serve at times, how much we put in. We become, and this is a dangerous place to be in church, we become the older son in the house. We become the older son, the one that the story talks about in the prodigal son. Remember that in Luke 15, 29? But the older son said, almost like what I, even what you can hear in the church today, look! Look at me. Look at all these years I've been, you know, been slaving, been working, been part of the church, and you never, and, and I never disobeyed your orders. The church in Ephesus fell into that trap, that very trap that the older son, the older son was doing great and mighty things. He was. He, he was working hard. He was working hard, but his he didn't have that right mindset. He had the whole work thing done, but the, there was no relationship there. The Church of Ephesus fell into the trap, this performance trap. They were a popular church. There was a lot of, to boast about in this Church of Ephesus. Matter of fact, Paul founded the church there, served as its pastor for a few years. He wrote First and Second Corinthians while he was there. He even left Timothy, he left Timothy, left Timothy there for a bit. John spent the last years of his life there as well, writing his gospel and three epistles there. And tradition tells us that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was buried there. When John writes Revelation, not only had the believers been under excellent leadership, they were the second, second generation of believers. They were seasoned believers and knew that church is all what church was all about. They really know how to do church. They have become professionals in the church. They become professionals in what they do. They were doing many things right. In fact, we have the impression that they were doing many things, period. They were doing hard work. They were passionate. They actually knew the doctrine. Soon they placed their work for Christ before their worship of Christ. I'm going to repeat that again. They got to a place where it's dangerous to be, but they placed their work for Christ, their duty for Christ, their routine for Christ, before their worship for Christ. And I want all of us, right? And all of us, when you hear this message, I want all of us to examine our hearts and say, God, is that me? Even me, I have to get like that. Is that even me? I can do a lot of things for you. I can do a lot of work for you. But am I still spending the time as I should have when having a relationship with you? When faith is traditional, like with the Pharisees in Jesus' time, you end up praising God with your lips while your heart is far from you. The Ephesians believe, the Ephesian believers had not only become professional and automatic, and routine, they had become deluded by the importance of that service. They placed service above their love for Christ. And again, don't we sometimes do that? I would even examine our hearts even now. Our service for God becomes the focus of our relationship with God. Our work for God has become the focus of that relationship. As if He is only concerned about what we do for Him and not what who we are in Him. I'm going to repeat that again, because I think it's so great. 
and so important. Our service for God becomes the focus of our relationship with God, as if He is the only, as if He is only concerned about what we do for Him and not who we are in Him. It is amazing to know that the father loves the younger son who squandered all his wealth and the older son who has been faithful working in the field. It takes Jesus to tell them that. They need to look again at the Christ whom they love, not to focus on the works that they have done. Don't be deceived by your own importance. It is a privilege to serve. It is. And I want you to hear that. I, I want you to hear my heart on that. I'm not saying don't serve. It is a privilege to serve. It is incredible to serve. We have to serve. That's what Christ has created us for. We, we all have different giftings and different talents to serve in different areas and different ministries. Matter of fact, I, I pray every single week for a different ministry in this church. It is by His grace we are able to to do that. It is, by, it is by His grace we are able to. It must be, though, motivated by love. It's got to be motivated, not just, I want to do, you know, not just to do it to do it, not just to do it and get it over with and get it done. You see what I did here, God? I hope you're satisfied because I did this all for you. No. <coughs> no. You can almost you know, part of me is just thinking almost the sacrifice of Cain and Abel. You know, the, their hearts. It's a heart. It always, it always comes down to our hearts, church. It always comes down to our heart. Abel's sacrifice and Cain's sacrifice. It always comes down to our heart. They both had a, they both had a sacrifice. But what was in their heart? And that's the thing. You, we both, two, there could be two people that are working their tails off, but it's where is their heart, their relationship, their first love of Jesus Christ? What is motivating? Are they just doing it to do it, to get it done, just work more and work longer and work harder? Or is it our relationship with God and I'm working because I love? I'm working. That's why, you know, that's a, in, a, in a marriage, in a marriage, why do we do things for our spouse? It's not, you know, it, because it's that, it's that love, it's that, it's that in that relationship that, that motivates us to do things um, for those that we love, because we're motivated by love. And so if we're easily motivated by love to help our loved ones, how much more we have to do it for our Lord and Savior? Amen. Don't serve, though, also to show off. Don't compare it to others. Don't show others, hey, look what I did. Don't be proud if you're doing a better job than others. Don't serve to please others. Don't serve to impress. And if, as a matter of fact, I would even challenge you if that's the reason why you're serving, I'd rather you not serve. I'd rather you not serve if that's your motivation. These are the common mistakes we make. Does the Lord know all that you are doing for Him? Yes. Matter of fact, He does know what you're doing. Matter of fact, He even said it to the Church of Ephesians, I see your needs. I know what you're doing. I know it. I see it. And tell them what exactly they did. Do you think the Lord knows the work you did behind the scenes? He sure does. Do you think he knows the work you did at home? Yes. All the work you put in for your Sunday school class or for your C group? Yes. For our outreaches? Where no one thanks you and encourages you because um, no one even notices what you're doing? Yes, he sees that. He sees when no one else sees it, he sees it. Matter of fact, again, he says, I know your deeds. And he said that as an encouragement. That is something bad, but he said it as an encouragement. I see your deeds. I see what you're doing here. I see the work. That's great. I, I, that's great. I, I love that. But then he gave the balancing statement. He notices it and affirms it. Jesus then highlights something that was not pleasing to him. He said, I see the deeds. I see your work, and that's great. And that's awesome. But you've also... More important than that, you've forsaken your relationship, your first love. Matter of fact, Jesus is more concerned about your eternity than your works. He's more concerned about what you can take to heaven than just all the work that's going to stay on earth. Our relationship with him will help. Our relationship with him, though, dictates the work that we, we do for him. In other words, and in, in other words, they no longer love him like they used to. The honeymoon is over. They may not have stopped loving him, but that deep, passionate feel for the Lord is now gone. 
They are still busy for him, but they are no longer in love with him. And I hope this, I, and I hope this cannot be true, but it is. We can be busy working for him and yet not loving him. When you're in love, when you are in love, and many of us have been, when you're in love, nothing you do for your loved one, like I said before, is a burden. When you, when you, when you lost that love, a, a simple task, though, can be a chore. You did not quit. You were still busy doing that job, but the love there isn't there anymore. You're just now doing it as a task. And when you do, when you... When you keep doing a task without that love, then that bitterness starts to set in. Then the pride starts settling in. You gotta check your spirit. Because you gotta check your spirit then. Oh, do you see what they're doing? I wish they would see what I'm doing. You know what? Does Pastor see what I'm doing? Do others see what I'm doing? Do they know how long I've been here? Do they know how long I've been part of this place? Do they know how long I've been part of this church? Because then it's like, then it is becoming more about you. It, the, the relationship is starting to subside, and then it becomes just more about centered on you. Because something's got to be God. Something's got to be God. Vacuums don't exist. Something's got to take control. And if it's not the King of Kings, then you become it, and you do it all. And see me, see what I've done, and sing my praises. We gotta be in a cloy, and, and we might not say that. I don't think anyone says sing my praises. But the thing is, is that we can get to a place where we can see, not look what the Lord has done, but look what I have done. That's a dangerous position to be in. Very dangerous. We gotta check our spirits, and we gotta check our hearts about that. And I would say almost daily. We all need to. If the things we do for him today have become more of a chore or a burden, a frustrating routine, it could be because we have fallen away in this love relationship that we have with the Lord. Jesus did not just tell them the problem, but he gave them the solution, and I love that. Jesus just doesn't say, okay, here's your problem, now fix it. No, he actually helped us with it. And how is that found? Revelation 2, 5 eight it says, Consider how far you have fallen. Here's what you need to do. Repent. Repent and do the things you did at first. Have you ever been in love? I'm not just saying, do you know God? Do you read the scriptures? Do you know everything that God... You know, I'm not just saying all the stuff you know when you're happy. Have you really, truly fallen in love? I mean, in a deep, passionate love of Jesus. Have you ever had that experience where you have just cried out to him and you've poured out your life to him and you've just given him everything in your life? That's the Those are just sweet times. Those are sweet experiences. I love those times where I in my office where I just I just break down and it's just it's just it's just a, an incredible time that I'm having with the Lord. Matter of fact, in many of us, when we do this, it's like we said, okay, now is the time I'm gonna do my devotions, you know. You know, in the morning, it's the first thing I do. But then there's some times I'm just in my office or I'm just doing something and then just, shoo. Because here's the thing, relationships just don't happen for half an hour in the morning, you know. Uh, but that's what we feel like. All right, you're checking in my relationship with God. I will read his word. Wow, that really touched me. All right, I'm going to read my devotion. Ouch, that really hurt. All right, now my next 20 minutes. All right, go. Okay, God, um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Oh, okay, punch back in. Get to my computer. I'll see you tomorrow. And then, no, matter of fact, that's how we treat God sometimes, is I punch in for the relationship, I punch out, and then I go do what I want to do. Now, the thing is, is that we all are like that. I even get like that. Matter of fact, we're all human. And sometimes we feel like in the morning, it's like, oh, yeah, i got to do that. Okay, let me just get it out of the way. I'm going to be honest. We all can get like that because we have busy lives. We do have calendars. But God isn't bound by that. And so sometimes God wants to speak to us I, I, mm, outside our devotional time. It's a secret. Don't tell anyone else. Don't tell anyone else. But sometimes that God wants to speak to us outside of our quiet time. Matter of fact, God's sweet aroma has spoken to me some, uh, a lot of times 
more outside those times than inside those times. And I'm sure many of you have felt that before. I'm at my computer and I'm working, that was me this week, I'm just working at my computer, you know, just, I don't even know what I was doing, whatever. And you know, I was probably playing video games. But the thing is, is I was, uh, no, I'm working on something, and then all of a sudden the spirit just fell, and I just started to bust out a big cry, and we, were, we just had a great coming to the Jesus moment right there. It was just sweet. It was just an incredible time. And it was one of those crying, have you ever cried where you can't control your cry? It's, it was like, oh, I think I'm tear. No, it was one of those times where you just had the river flowing, and it just, you couldn't help it, you're crying, and you're just, and this is my prayer, I'm crying at the same time. You know what? Please no one come through the front door. Please no one come through the front door, dear Lord. I will get whatever you want, but I don't want anyone right now. Hey, pastor! Uh, but it was just sweet. And those are the times where God loves to speak to me. It's those times where it's out of, it's like God saying, you know what? I want to work outside your bubble. I want to work outside your tradition. I want to work outside your your your. Your automatic kind of, you put me in a box way too long, and I can't be put in a box. Be open to what God wants to do in your life. Not the half an hour you give him, but give him your whole day, your whole month, your whole year. God, whenever you want to talk to me, talk. Whenever you want to spend time with me, spend time with me. Whenever you want, you know what? Whenever you want to be, whenever you want to bump in my schedule, go for it. We need to give God the permission to bump our schedule. We need to give God permission to mess us up. We need to give God all of our time, not just a half an hour, but all of our time. Amen. God, speak to me. Here I am, Lord. Speak to me. Here I am. Excuse me. Here I am. Touch me. Here I am. Have your way in me, Lord God. But we must know that. And I don't know why I got on that tangent because that has nothing to do about, about you know, Ephesians. But, but I just want us to, I guess what I'm saying is, yes, it is. Because the thing is, if we truly want Christ to be that number one relationship with him. Like, I don't ever think you, um, as you see, I always prepare, but I, I, a lot of times I don't get to everything. I don't ever think you go to your spouse and say, you know what? I, I want to improve things in this relationship with ours. You know, I, I know that I haven't really been giving you the time that you deserve. So what? what I, you know what? I'm going to give you between eight and eight thirty. You know what? I, I think I'm going to do that. Um, you know what? I, you know what? We're going to chat a little bit. We're going to talk. Maybe we can read a book together. You know, and then when that's done, you're going to do your thing, and then I'll do mine. And then maybe at night we can come back together and I might just say, a little, oh yeah, before we eat, maybe we'll say two sentences together. And then you eat and then I eat and then I'll, we'll do our separate things again. And But before we go to bed, you know what, I might just say I love you, but I don't really want to say too much more after that. You, we, we wouldn't fathom that. We wouldn't fathom that. But yet with God, we feel we really can do that. I will give you the time here. Maybe before I eat, I'll say a couple things. And maybe before I go to bed, I'll say I love you. But other than that, I really don't want to talk to you. And wow, if you would talk to me, let's set 8, 830. Then we can. And I'm just saying that again for me. Maybe I'm just preaching to me. But that's how we get to. We almost are like, here's my schedule. Here's my calendar. I've divided it for you. But please don't, don't overflow into the other stuff that I have planned. I have you, and I have me, and that's really going to work really well for me, you know? So what I'm saying is we got to be encouraged to say, God, break my calendar, whatever you need to do. If this relationship with, you know, with, with us is going to work, then it's, it's kind of, because if it's not all you now, if it's not all God now, what do you think in heaven? Okay, now, woo! Okay, now we're in heaven. Okay, I think now my calendar's clear. So, I completely lost where I am, but that's good, all right? Making you guys in your, in your spaces even harder. Um, but let's start where I see there on the screen. Um, so repent, so repent. All right, um, Jesus, um, you know what, I'm going to go to someone that I normally never quote to, but I thought his quote was really good. It's a St. Augustine, and I want you to see this. I thought it really did fit. Um, again, I don't usually quote from 
from, from this, but I thought this really had a lot to say. To fall in love with God is the greatest romance. Treat it like a romance. Remember everything you had to do to woo your spouse? You know? God wants, to, God wants that too. God wants to be loved like that too. To seek Him is the greatest adventure. To find Him, the greatest human achievement. Jesus said, remember these things. That's where you need to start. It always starts with the mind. Recalling the sweet memories of the past will restart your love for a person. Remembering the things someone has done for you can rekindle our appreciation. Sometimes we do that with our spouse, some of those things we first did, you know, that's why they always say to date your spouse, always keep dating your spouse, you know, those things that you did at first that, you know, that you always love to do and, and all that, keep doing those, you always keep that spark alive. Same as with Jesus, remember when you first started with Jesus, you're like, I want to read this whole thing, man, I want to read it all tonight, and then I'm going to, I'm going to listen to all this, uh, I'll be honest, uh, last week was a little, little, I, you know, I came to know the Lord in the 80s, and one of the big, uh, one of the big, and I don't know if all of you know this, but in the 80s, I was, I came to know the Lord, and so wherever you come to know the Lord, whatever that music was, really means something to you. Well, there was an individual named Carmen when I came to know the 80s, and he would sing. As a matter of fact, he really didn't sing. He would just have these songs, and he would just speak through these songs, uh, like a courtroom or whatever. Uh, matter of fact, if you're around my age or so, every youth group did a human video on one of his, on one of those Carmen songs. Uh, but anyway, he passed away last week at the uh, age of 65 with complications of a surgery. He just laid out a new, he just was about to go on a new tour. And unfortunately, he passed away. But, um, but yeah, he really, he, if, some of his songs really just speak uh, about the love uh, of Jesus Christ and what God is doing. Um, and how he speaks to me. And so this last week was one of those times where I played some of the songs that really spoke to me and God was really speaking to me. And I have no clue why I even brought him up. But you know what? It was a big deal to me. And so I wanted to bring that up. But what I was getting at is that just like we did for our spouse, we need to do that for God. Um, what are, you know, reading the word, loving the word. Remember when you... Uh, oh yeah, that's where I was getting to with Carmen. Is I remember when I first came to know the Lord, I wanted to read everything I could, and then I remember telling some Christians, I'm like, tell me, what are some, what are some of the old music that I was listening to? I don't like it. I, I you know, I, it just in my spirit. I, I give me some. What are some worship songs? What are some? What are some music that people who know Christ? I don't even know how to say it. I said, are there music that people who know Jesus listen to? You know, I, I just said it really weird. And they're like, yeah, yeah, there's like Carmen. Uh, there's like, there's this group called uh, DC Talk. Uh, there's this, you know, uh, Twyla Paris. Um, you know, some of the oldies, but goodies. And so what I did is then I, I put a, a talk about everything I did when I first came to know the Lord. I remember I was like, okay, all right, where can I hear said stuff? And they're like, oh, there's more, there, you can hear it on the radio. I'm like, are you serious? You can listen to Christian music on the radio? I'm like, whoa, that's incredible. And so I remember listening to that. I'm like, boy, but I wish there was a way I could really keep it. So I remember listening. I'm like, I, yeah, some of it's good, but some of it, ah, whatever. So I remember putting a cassette tape in there. And when a real good song came, I'd hit record. And I'd make myself mix tapes so that I could listen to them later. And so then I would read the word and listen to that. And then I wanted to tell everyone about what I was reading. And I remember I wanted to tell everyone about this thing called Christian music. And I was just excited, and, and I wanted people to know the Lord. I told my parents, you know, I just got in my parents' face about how much I love the Lord and all this stuff. And we were all there, church. If you knew Jesus, we were all there. Are we still there? I'm going to unfortunately say no. You know, even as the pastor, you know, that excitement, you know, um, and so the world then gets in and the enemy gets in saying, oh, you don't need to be that on fire for God. You don't need that much passion. You just need enough to get you through. So we have to examine our hearts. If God's saying to Ephesians, you need to get back to your first love, he's probably saying that to Celebration Assembly. We need to get back to our first love. We need to get passionate again, excited again, telling others about him. Can't wait to read the word, not in a half an hour, but throughout the day get into the word. Not just praying in a half an hour, but praying here and there throughout the whole day. Listening to worship music. Listen, and now here's the thing, and I know I'm, you know, I'm not saying just listen to, you've got to be careful to it. I'm saying, 
the, the older I'm getting here, and this is just me, but the older I'm getting here, the less like, and I, I, I really want to be careful what I'm saying here, the less I'm not into Christian music, the more I'm into worship music. I don't want to just hear a story about what you're going through. I want to just worship God. You know, and that's just me. I, maybe it's my walk with the Lord right now, but there is a definite difference between Christian music and worship music. Christian music is, uh, I'm going to be honest, there's some Christian music out there that still sounds a lot like me, me, me. I was here. I was there. This is what I did. Without knowing what did God do? You know, and so I'm really into worship music because I just want to worship God. I just, I don't want to hear your story. I want to just worship God. Now, maybe that, now if you first come to know the Lord, maybe that's going to minister to you and that's going to be great because you're going to hear people's stories through their songs. But I'm at the place right now where I just want to, maybe that's where you need to be. You know, maybe you're not finding satisfaction in Christian music because you need to go into worship music. You need to get to hill songs or gateway worship um, or um, river valley worship. I mean, I can help you find incredible worship music that you can just pump into your car or whatever and just go to the Lord what he has for you. Um, it is when, um, I, you know what, I'm probably not even going to finish this message, but that's okay. It is when you sit down and think about God's goodness, when we count his blessings and recalling our past experience with him, that we are most drawn to him. Remember, remember is such an important thing. Israelites were told again and again these days, when God led you out of Egypt, we were told to remember those days when God's love and presence is so close. When he provided for our needs miraculously. When he touched you and healed you from your sickness. When, you opened the way for, when he opened the way for you when you found a new job and a new hope. We remember anniversaries for this purpose. To relive those sweet memories of our relationship with the people that matter the most in our lives. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Remember those times and repent and change of mind. This is the natural outcome of remembering. Remember these times and repeat. Repeat those things. You realize that you have moved away from where you should be, or rather, your heart has moved away. That is when we repent. And what is repenting? Is when you stop what you're doing and you turn completely around. You just turn, you don't turn 45 degrees, you don't turn 90 degrees. You turn 180 degrees and you go back in the other direction. Don't go on with the same routine. Don't carry on with a busy survey or with all the burdens and the stress. Stop and give it to Jesus. Revelation 2, 5, the second part again says, repent and do the things you did at first. It's a changed lifestyle. Return to the things you did at first. Remember the time you were so excited about worship? Remember those, remember, again, and, and I, I'm not going to talk about it at home, but remember at church you just couldn't get enough of it, and you're, hmm. Remember the times when you used to raise your hands? Hallelujah. Remember the times where you used to get on your knees? Remember the times where you were so in love, you came to the altar? Where are those times? And I want us to be honest. You know, now we're way too busy with stuff. What about just raising our hands to God? What about just getting on our knees in front of the Lord? What, what used to happen to the word carry? We would just stay and just bask in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Not needing to get out to get to lunch, but just needing to get on our knees for God. Remember those times when you first came to know the Lord and you were, maybe you were in youth group and you were lifting your hands up and you were giving praise and glory to God and you were loving it. And now, where is that? I want us to examine our hearts in a big way. Because here's the thing, God hasn't changed, we've changed. We have turned away. We have settled for something less and probably it, it probably has a lot to do with just routine, the world, what you listen to. Just things have changed. And, and what about just getting radically in love with the God that you first did, whether it be in the 60s, 70s, or 80s? Love the Lord, your God, all over again. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Jordan, why don't you come on up? As I close, I think I have one more thing there. Now, it's, it's basically, I'm going to end with how I began. Our love for Christ 
is more important to him than all of our service, all of our service to him. And as Jordan comes up, I want to end with one more, I'm going to just end with one more scripture. And then I want us to seek God like we did when we first knew him. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. It's the love chapter. It's, I read this every time I marry someone. Um, it had sounded wrong. No, I'm only married once, okay? Uh, I've only been married once. See, I say this every time. Every time I get married. It's, it's become so routine, I haven't memorized. I'm glad Katie's done with the children right now. Well, when I perform someone's marriage, I use this all the time. All the time. I love this. And, and it's called the love, uh, the love chapter. And you'll see why. Um, and you, I'm sure you've heard this. But may it be true in your heart right now as you hear this. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have, and I, if I have faith, if I have faith, if I even have faith and trust and I can move them out, but do not have love, I have nothing. So that means that even if I have the faith and I work really hard and I can do great things, but, I have lived, but if I do not have love, I, I have nothing. If I even give all my possessions to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but not have love, I gain nothing. You can do everything. You can, you can, you can go through torture. You can give everything you have. You can do a lot of good works. But if you don't have your relationship with God, it is nothing. You have gained nothing. You can work yourself to hell without a relationship with Jesus Christ. So all that's done and all eyes closed. I do believe this. I, I do believe this message is speaking to all of us. To all of us. Because I don't know if there's anyone in this room that could say, I am as in love for God now as when I first came to know the Lord. Or I don't know if there's anyone in this room that says, I have achieved, I am perfect in my relationship with God. Wow! And we are so, so good. I, I, I just, I pray to Him all day. I'm reading all day. It is so good. No, I think all of us, all of us could take a page and improve. Think of those times that you were excited about being a Christian. That you were excited about Christ. What were some things that you were doing? Again, everyone is different. Are there certain things that you can do today that you've already stopped doing? You no longer feel the same today. You need to pray and ask for the strength to draw you back. To draw you back home. To draw you back to the first love. I really feel like everything going on with COVID and uncertainty is God saying you need to come back to the first love. You're too drawn by the, you're too drawn by media. You're too drawn by what you're seeing on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram. You're too drawn away. Matter of fact, to tell you the truth, maybe many of us had a strong relationship because that was pre-social media day. And God is not there saying, well, I understand it's a busier world. Yes, you got your flat screen TV, you got your, your Netflix, you got your Hulu, you got your this, you got your that. I understand. It's okay. We're, I'll be waiting for you when all is said and done. I'll clean the mansion for you. No. I bet God is not, I bet God is brokenhearted. I think the enemy is the one who makes so much technology that we're too busy for God. Now, I'm not saying the technology is bad, because I have some of that technology. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is that have you ever found that maybe you've spent way too much time on your phone looking at stuff instead of spending time with God? Hallelujah. Again, I'm not saying it's wrong, but are you spending more time with idols in your life without spending time with the King of Kings and the Lord of Examine what you first started and get in love with God over and over and over and over again. If we could all, if we could all stand, Elliot, Helen, if you could come forward.
here. What we're going to do is I'm going to pray. We're going to end like what we always would. What is the Holy Spirit speaking to you about? What is the Holy Spirit wooing you to? Matter of fact, I would, I, matter of fact, I would predict right now, predict right now that the Holy Spirit is bringing you back to when you first got saved. Matter of fact, I want the Holy Spirit. Right now, Holy Spirit. We're, I'm going to get right into it now. Right now, Holy Spirit, I want you right now to, to bring everyone back to when they first came to know you. Right now. Hallelujah. Now, Holy Spirit, I want you to reveal how they are now. And Holy Spirit, if there is any change that needs to happen, I pray that you would convict them and you would challenge their heart to bring them back to their first love. Matter of fact, Jesus would not have said that this is important to us if he didn't say it. For Jesus to say that, for God to say that Ephesians, that is a problem, then I think it's a problem for us as well. God would rather have us, have our first, for us to have a strong relationship with us going to heaven than working hard not knowing. So Lord, bring us back to that first love.